It's fucking great! Now, I don't normally do reviews on this channel, let alone anime that aren't completely Yuri, but I just have to talk about this little gem that I picked up not too long ago. It is filled to the brim with charm, creativity, beauty, and meticulous juicy detail. And don't worry, we'll get to that soon enough. Now, newsflash, I have not read the manga, so this video will only focus on the anime. I'll also be spoiling everything up to episode 13. So if you're not caught up with the show, then... Ah, uh, whatever. Alright, let's get cooking. So very quickly, here's the plot of the show. A group of adventurers venture down into a magical dungeon where they confront a vicious dragon. The dragon eats one of the adventurers named Fallon Hole, but not before she teleports everyone else to safety outside of the dungeon. The remaining adventurers vow to save Fallon before she's digested and revive her with magic. But this time, the gang plan accordingly and make use of the dungeon's many monstrous delicacies as they hunt down the ultimate cuisine slash predator. Now with that out of the way, let's go over the four stars of the show and what makes them such a fantastic ensemble. Our trusty protagonist Lyos and his childlike fascination with all things monster related is such a joy to watch. And it's never overbearing or tiresome hearing him spit out some monster facts or gushing over the latest wacky monster dish. He has the right amount of charm, curiosity, and relatability. Someone who serves as a great lens for the audience into this fun yet bizarre premise. Next is Chilchuck, the pint-sized locksmith. He kind of fills out that cynical and slightly jaded side of the party, which is ironic given his youthful appearance. And I don't mean that as a negative, by the way. In fact, with all the crazy monster harvesting going on, I appreciate that he serves as the voice of reason most of the time. He's a realist, and a great foil to Lyos' spontaneous hijinks. Next, we have the elven mage, Marcel, and admittedly one of the things that drew me into the show for reasons we can discuss later. It never gets old seeing her put up a cautious front when being faced with a new, potentially life-threatening monster concoction. But that doesn't mean she's a total stick in the mud. Despite being a worrywart, Marcel is probably the bravest and most determined member of the party, and it shows in her dedication to rescue Fallon. And kudos to our voice actors for being able to deliver such a wide-ranging performance. You can really get a sense of concern, naivete, and whimsy in her voice. In fact, everyone does a fantastic job with her characters, so kudos all around. By golly, even the English voice cast are great. And that's a sentence you won't hear me say a lot. Also, for the Yuri fans out there, you might recognize Marcel's voice pretty quickly. <laughs> Hopefully, that's a good sign. Overall, she's a very sweet and reliable character. Not to mention the best elf girl of the entire year. Because there's certainly no one else who can come close to that title. Nope, no one else. And last but not least, we have my favorite character of the series. The bold and beautiful purveyor of banquets, Senshi. This man is a true wonder of worlds, and an absolute delight to watch when he works his magic. It always fills my heart with such creamy goodness seeing a character so passionate about their work. Especially when it's nailed down to such delightful detail. And it may seem a bit minor, but I really appreciate how he naturally rejects magic due to his character being grounded and very hands-on with his practices. It goes to show that in a world full of luxurious conveniences, there's ample satisfaction in learning all the practical know-hows and getting things done the old-fashioned way. See this? See this? The oven door isn't working. It's falling off the hinges. So what do we do? It's very simple. You gotta make the hinges tighter so the oven door is more secure. So what you do is, you take out your phone, and you call the handyman. So there's our wonderful cast of goofballs. Honestly, there's really nothing negative I have to say about them. Even the designs, as straightforward as they are, just makes me smile. In fact, the words I use to describe everything in this show are delightful and charming. Now let's get to the main focus of the series. The food porn, as the kids like to say these days. Right off the bat, I just have to credit the show when making such wild and wacky ingredients so undeniably delectable. And the trick, of course, is to give them all a spin on real-world dishes. Even if you haven't tried cuisine similar to those, featured in the show, the showrunners make sure to go through every painstaking detail by showcasing appropriate cooking techniques and animating the sheen, folds, and drip of every superb dish to really get your salivary glands firing. And speaking as someone who loves learning and trying out new recipes, and has eaten a fair share of bizarre unconventional foods, I felt right at home watching these mini cooking segments. The only thing I wish they did differently is put some more description on how the food tastes. This may be my snootiness coming through, but there are more adjectives to describe food other than 
delicious, good, and tasty. I guess an obvious limitation to this is that because all the ingredients are specific to this fantasy world, you can't really have the characters describing and comparing the stuff they're eating to other bizarre dishes or animals, since we'd have no idea what they're talking about. Wait a minute. Actually, thinking about it, all the weird stuff they're eating are just unique to dungeons, right? And everything else on the surface appear to be normal foods we're used to seeing. So I guess they could compare dungeon foods to existing foods, and get more insight into their texture and taste and stuff like that. But at the same time, it's not like the characters are food connoisseurs. I mean, aside from Senshi. So it might be kind of weird if one of them went, Ah, yes. The light, delicate flesh of this giant parasite is quite akin to the savory meat of a spring-harvested freshwater eel. Every bite unleashes a torrent of sweet and fatty layers that melt like Bavarian goat butter. Forsooth, this felicitous fare has granted much favor to my multifarious palate. Anyway, next I want to briefly talk about the animation. There is not a single scene that goes by where I'm not in awe from the outstanding level of detail. Whether it's from the small but expressive movements of the characters, or the absolutely mind-boggling textures in their many menu items. I mean, this is part of the course for the Imagineers at Trigger Studio. They make sure you feel every punch, every bite, and every ridiculous over-the-top final smash. Forget maximum overdrive, your senses will be set on turbo. Also, I just want to point out how surprised I was that Trigger made an anime that wasn't originally by them. I was always under the impression that they did original anime only, but I think this is their first anime where they weren't the creators behind it. I mean, I know they made Edge Runners and did some Star Wars episodes, but in those cases, they were just taking an IP and providing original stories to them. Correct me if I'm wrong about anything, but yeah, Trigger continues to set the bar high when it comes to visual storytelling, and it really goes to show how the presentation of an anime really determines how passionate the show runners are, and how much respect they have for the audience. <coughs> now before I start sounding like a total simp, I do actually have some criticisms I would like to address. Nothing too major, just a couple of things in the anime that made me raise an eyebrow. So the first thing is when Marcel suddenly revealed that she can use dark magic in episode 12. I feel like this needed a little bit of a setup earlier in the series. Like a small hint to the characters or the audience that Marcel was hiding this forbidden jutsu from her party members. After all, this was apparently a pretty big deal to everyone, and it's the X-Factor that led to Fallon being saved in the end. It would also be nice if we had more info on what the hell dark magic even is. What makes it different from regular magic? Does it have a funny accent? Another thing that was weird was that really drawn out Chilchuck section in episode 13. The whole point of these scenes was to convince Chilchuck to be honest with Laos and Marcel about returning to the surface, and that they don't endanger everyone further. But for some reason it goes on for almost the entire second half of the episode. And it doesn't help that throughout the entire sequence, Chilchuck explains to the York chick everything that we witnessed up to this point. Honestly, I was half expecting that we're gonna learn something important about Chilchuck. Maybe even a flashback scene of his past, to show why he bothers to stick around people that take unnecessary risks. I don't know, just something man. But yeah, other than that, not much else to complain about really. And now we finally come to the part you've all been waiting for, shippers. I'll admit what initially drew me to this anime was the flood of fan art in the last couple of months. And just like Boeing's safety standards, I had to do some investigating. So right off the bat I knew they weren't canon, but I was still curious what their relationship was and what kind of trials and tribulations they go through that warrants such a positive response in the Yuri community. Despite being apart from each other for almost the entirety of the series, we do get some interesting scenes between them. They first met when they were kids, or at least Valen was a kid. I'm not sure how how old Marcel is, over well, there being an elf in that. But we learned that Marcel's goal in life was to create her own dungeon, and thanks to Fallon bringing her to one, she was able to realize the nuances that come with them. Clearly this moment had a big impact on Marcel, and she's stuck with Fallon ever since. And like I mentioned before, we see many times in the series how devoted Marcel is in saving Fallon, even going as far as begging Namari to join their party again. But honestly, they all pale in comparison to that wild bathing scene. Now to the uninitiated, they might watch the scene and think to themselves, sweet, they're giving us some tea. TNA. I like some TNA. But to those who have opened their third eye, it's clearer than a greasy piece of parchment paper what they're trying to do here. Yes, part of the scene is to hint that something's not right with Fallon, seeing as though she was resurrected with dark magic. But most importantly, we're shown many indications that zoom past subtexty nonsense. The fact that both girls get embarrassed when they're touched, the way the shots are framed, and the slow, tender embrace of their delicate hands. I know it's a bit of a meme in the Yuri world to talk about lewd handholding, but my goodness, how do you watch this scene and not feel the love tonight. And it was also a nice little callback when Marcel reached her hand out to Fallon to reassure her. Which of course is supposed to mirror when Fallon reassured Marcel as they ventured down into that dungeon. Hey, I can pick up on subtle moments like that. So yeah, I can see why this ship is picking up so much steam. And I'm excited to see how Marcel and the gang will rescue their beloved Fallon. 
Well, that's my take on the anime so far. There's tons of other things I can compliment too, like the music, the world building, the creativity. But we beer all day and I got loads of anime to watch. Oh yeah, I'm interested in seeing how the second half of the series will stack up. My guess is that it's gonna be a little more plot focused. We got all the lighthearted stuff out of the way, and now things are starting to get serious. I just hope they remember to stuff our faces full of delicious dungeon food every now and then. Cause at the end of the day, that's the real star of the show. Anyway, see you around.